obviously invest in yourself first. It's the best money you'll ever send. Okay. Nobody can steal it from you. Nobody can, can lock it down. I mean, it, it's, it's yours. And it may be very, very important if you have to start doing some new tasks. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm in Seattle with Jim Hansen, who is a financial consultant. Thank you for joining me. I heard Jim in 2008 at an ASPO conference, which was Association for the Study of Peak Oil. And you did a presentation, Jim, and sort of looking at the financial side of things. And what you said that really snagged me, you said, every decision I make, whether it's a personal investment or a, a you know, invest money investment, I run through my peak oil filter. What do you mean by that? Well, as I, as I put up there was this bubble chart. Mm -hmm. And on that bubble chart, in the center, we had this circle that said peak oil on it. Okay. And then as I filled in around the outside, um, different things like oil and gas. And that. But everything that we looked at had to fit through this peak oil idea, this, this thesis of a limited and constrained resource. So, so anything we looked at for what? In, in your well, for, life? From, our, from my investment portfolio. And, okay. and, 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 and I'll in a moment come to how I came to this peak oil question. Yeah, yeah. But, so we developed this, this idea, this thesis, that if peak oil occurs, it's going to be so important, it will dominate most everything else that we do. Mm -hmm. Because energy is, some people know I use the term master resource, it drives everything. Okay. And so, okay. so we, if it can't fit an investment idea, through this peak oil filter, then we go no further with it. So uh, a good example would be uh, mass, air mass market air travel. We're, we're not going to pursue that because it's so dependent on cheap fuel that at some point it, 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 it will come unstuck. In the short run, I can be completely wrong. But in the long run, I think I'm right if the peak oil thesis is right. Okay. And then, and then, but equally important was the largest bubble on the outside that we put there was community issues. If I get everything right in my investment portfolio, but the community I live in gets it wrong, it could overwhelm everything I've done personally. And so I put that as very, very, very important, and that's why I, am so, I try to be so active in getting to the community and getting across to people that peak oil is a real story and we have to be concerned about it. Because even if I have my investment portfolio locked down, it's totally in line with the peak oil thesis. But the town, the community, and the state, and the locality that I live in comes unstuck, it won't matter. Tell me, tell me, take us a little further into that. Well, or well take us back I, for a second. Yeah. How'd you get to the peak well, oil yeah. part? Well, the, how I came to the peak oil is that I've been in this business now for about 25 years. And I had the traditional portfolio going back in 2003. And a couple of the positions that I owned were some foreign oil companies. And the reason was it was a little bit of hedge on the dollar. It was a good dividends. And um, it's a major company. So has, they're not in debt and there's a lot of assets. In the fall, late fall of 2004, um, Shell Oil Company wrote down billions of dollars in reserves in Nigeria. And we had a position in Shell Oil. And so I, what did I miss? Because this was a huge fiasco. Wow. Okay. And, and they kept thinking, well, what did I miss? What, what, what? And so as I started digging into it more, I'd turn over little rocks and, and these little cockroaches would scurry <laughs> away with peak oil on their back. And, and I would find these little trails of peak oil, peak oil. And so I thought, I got to look into this more because I don't understand it. And as I dug into it, I started coming across people like, like Matt Simmons and, and Colin Campbell. And so as I read this material, it was fascinating. Um, I can kind of trace my whole aha series of moments there. Uh, like when I read Jim Kunstler's Long Emergency, mm -hmm. it's kind of like my eyes, boom, mm -hmm. whoa, I'd that never thought of this sense. scenario, you know. And, I've, and, then I've, and, and then Matt Simmons, uh, which book which came out later in 2005, the um, Twilight in the Desert, um, Campbell's work, um, people like um, Shell Acolette, and, and then it just, it was this, then I felt like I was getting fed by a fire hose. And by late, mid part of 2004, I had drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak. And I redid my entire business model. 
So what did they te tell you? I mean, for, for our vis viewers who may not be familiar with peak oil or up on it, what, did you, what was the Kool-Aid? Well, the, the scenario is that once you begin to realize that 95% that of the transportation fuel in the world is oil. So we're gonna move goods, services, people, it's oil. And therefore, if that becomes constrained, I didn't know enough yet, but I knew enough that, that if it's gonna become constrained, then the economy is gonna be in trouble. And certain businesses in particular are gonna be in trouble. Yeah. So I'm saying, well, there's a high risk there. Now, not just for the businesses, but society in general, and it goes way beyond. Once you start to realize there's a big societal risk, then you also start to want to do more than just the investment part of it. You know, a big part of what I do goes way beyond the investment because I think people have to get their head around the idea of peak oil, then they can get their lifestyle in, in, in place because if you don't have your energy lifestyle in place, you're gonna get run over by a, a freight train. Um, what I arrived at then was that if this is truly gonna unfold, it's gonna shape everything I do. And the traditional investment strategies aren't gonna necessarily work. So I began to reshape the whole thing. And that's how I arrived at this idea of this peak oil filter. So push everything through that. And if it doesn't come out the other side, then we're gonna go no further with it. We don't, and when I say we, is my son's involved with me mm -hmm, as well. Mm -hmm, and he mm -hmm. does a lot of the deep financial analysis for me. Okay. And so as you, as you come out the back end, you start having things that work. But more importantly, things that are gonna make the future work. Okay, now a lot of people immediately jump to, well, let's see, we gotta have alternative energy and mm -hmm, all those things, mm -hmm. but it goes way beyond that. I mean, because, that's the first thought yeah, is, first okay, thought. you know, we'll get, we'll get biofuels, we'll get um, um, electric cars, da, 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 da. we've got natural gas for a while, I mean, how do, you know, that's the first thing people think. First thing, I, and that was what I did too. I thought, well, I gotta get into alternative energies and all of these things. But then as I began to understand it more, I realized that the scale of what we're confronting mm -hmm. is so huge. Mm -hmm. uh, it, here's a visualization for you. It's like, how long would you have to stand at Niagara Falls to watch 20 million barrels a day of oil flow over Niagara Falls? Now, most people in Niagara Falls is a huge waterfall. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. But you gotta stand there for 20 minutes to watch 20 million barrels go by. It flows at about a, a, a million barrels a minute. So one day's consumption of US oil is 20 minutes, it's about of, a, a, of equivalent of, of water coming down exactly. the Niagara Falls. So then, and then the next day you come back, stand and watch again. And the next day you stand and watch again. And, that's, and, and, and so that's a kind of a, a, an aha moment of scale. And that's what we're trying to replace just, just for liquid fuels and the, and, the, and, the, and the liquid fuel. And it's the liquid fuel crisis is the one that will hit us mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. because that's the transportation crisis. It's the one that looms. So that's how I arrived at it. That's how I got this model. We've refined it since. But key to the whole thing is, even, again, even if you get your investments right, if you get the community wrong, it doesn't matter. The other is the amount of money you have to have invested in, say, energy assets. To make up for what you use for energy is huge. Huh. You want a, a, a fascinating yeah. little exercise would be to take a stock like, say, ExxonMobil and figure out how much capital you'd have to have invested in that to have an after-tax dividend that would fill your car with gasoline for a year. It runs into hundreds of thousands of dollars. Whoa, okay, I get it. So, so most people can't get enough investment assets to cover their own liquid fuel need, let alone their heating and electricity and all the others. This goes far deeper. That's why the community is so important. So, so when you say, if the community, tell me more about your vision of if the community gets it right or doesn't get it right, or, or the country, because we're sure not seeing a whole lot of political action. That's right. And or, or even awareness on the, on the main, you know, even in the mainstream media, that this is something looming. It, it, it has a sense of 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road. We don't need to be worried about this now. And uh, tell me about it. Well, first, I think that when I say community, it, it runs from the obvious, like community, mass transit, rapid transit, and, okay. and, tr and transit in general. But it even goes to some really deep things, like we've, we've created massive regional hospital centers. What does that mean about our health care system? When a person that lives maybe 60, 70 miles from this regional mm -hmm. centralized health care center, 
all of a sudden can't get in for the dialysis treatment? Are we going to have to have satellite facilities? How are we going to manage that? Those are the kinds of things. It goes from all the way from getting you to work to the fundamentals of how, how does health care distribute it. Okay. Because we've, we've tended to rely on cheap fuels to move people to places. And some of this maybe we have to turn that on its head. The other is that when you, a good example of why I think the political leadership has a trouble with this is we just go back to the mortgage fiasco, this mortgage fiasco. Back when the, 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 the government and the U.S. policy has been the home ownership, and one of the kind of unintended consequences of that was that when a lot of people got into home ownership who really couldn't afford to own a, say, half a million dollar asset that they had to operate and run because they didn't have the money to do that. Okay. But imagine if you were a politician and you, were going, and you realized that this was going down the wrong road. Home prices were going up too fast. We would borrowed too much money. You saw the writing on the wall. Could you have put the brakes on that? In other mm. words, as, so as, mm. as, Bar as, as, as Barney right. Frank would say, it's that no one has ever been elected per for preventing a crisis. Because if you prevent the That's crisis, true. you have to have, someone has to endure hardship. Then when the crisis doesn't happen, your opponent can then come back and say, look at all the trouble this guy caused, yes. and you didn't even need to do it. Jeez. Because it didn't happen. So, and so in the case of the home mortgages, if somebody had put the raised interest rates, raised lending standards, done all the things mm -hmm. that now in hindsight everybody with 2020 rear view vision is saying, well, you should have done that. Yeah. They couldn't have done that. Because the electorate, the, the political environment would have never allowed it. And, it's, and so now let's look at, at, at the peak oil scenario, which is even a little harder to nail down the timing of, because people are very concerned about the timing mm -hmm. of this issue. Well, if you're a politician, you say, well, we're going to raise the cost of fuels. Now, all of a sudden, people are, they can't get to work, and all of these issues. You're never going to get elected. So in fact, it seems to be in the system almost that you have to let the crisis unfold, and then we'll deal with it afterwards. You've got to wait for the hurricane to rip through New Orleans before we're going to worry about fixing those levees. So that may be the scenario we're in. It just may be an inevitability. I don't know exactly, wow. but I'm investing under the pers or, and when I say investing, it's, it's again, more than just in portfolio investing. It's the things I do with my life, the kinds of way I run my household, um, the, the things, you know, essentially it permeates everything we do. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. as this scenario unfolds, the timing's unknown. The inevitability of a liquid fuel squeeze, if we keep going down the road we're on, it, it's inevitable that's going to happen. Okay. The exact timing, okay. that, that's up in the air. So. So Give our, give our viewers a, a sense of what choices you've made in that bubble that has to do with your own energy use. So they can get a flavor for the ideas that they might consider, well, too. We, we were way early here in our home. We had solar hot water put on the house back in the early 80s. <laughs> and, okay. and, and for a long time looked like an idiot because natural gas prices collapsed because of a huge glut of supply, uh, which was a current, you know, maybe a similar scenario to what we're seeing now. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. But in the long run, it proved to be very, very nice. Um, we... Now, we do silly things like uh, we, we dry clothes on a rack still, and not that we can't afford to use a hair dryer in a room like or this. Air, uh, an air dryer, uh, you know, for sure. clothing. Sure. And, and because they last longer. And, oh, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's just the way we are. But we've, we've adapted a lifestyle that is not energy intensive. You know, if you want to be rich, you have a lifestyle which is below your assets. If you live a lifestyle that's below your income, you're rich. If your lifestyle is above your income, you're poor. Now, it doesn't matter whether you have a million dollars, $10 million, or $10. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. where your lifestyle is on that. Now, if you're living over your income now, or you're living over your asset base today, as things get tighter in a constrained peak oil environment, you're going to be one of the first ones to fall. Yeah. yeah. So, if you wanna, so there's a margin of safety. Is come bring your lifestyle down. And that, that includes not just energy, but all the other things in your life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Get your cost of living in line with your assets, wherever those are in that continuum. So, you, know, you can be so rich or poor. in here, you're talking about you know bringing down your cost of living where you can, right? Knowing that the cushion that you need for when gas is going to be more expensive and your heating oil or your petroleum, your propane, mm -hmm. whatever is going to be more expensive, you've got some right. breathing room. Yeah. So tell us about the car in your front driveway. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a, a 1992 Ford Explorer. An SUV. An SUV. Right. The classic. And, and, and it does. It gets child. like 18 miles a gallon. And, 
And uh, of course, now we bought it back in 92, which is, you know, 12 years before I came to the oil, or, sure. or you know, or sure. 10 years before. Uh, so, but, but we still have it. But like I had mentioned to you earlier, that um, when I asked you if you'd noticed what was in my driveway, um, that uh, it's, it's on, uh, you know, it's now on its fourth tank of gas for the year and had been only three and a half uh, tanks of gas in the 11, first 11 months. Until course, we had the snow. Until we had the, the snow the and then we had to drive week. the four wheel drive. So the point here is you don't use it a whole lot, no. right? And, you know, it's, it's got miles on it and it would cost you more to go well, try would, and replace it. It would cost wouldn't. more. It would be, from a carbon standpoint, you'd have all the carbon inputs of the new vehicle to replace it. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why. Its utility value to me is very high and its market value is very low. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and so again, there's the finance side of the, the whole sure, scenario playing sure. in. And so, yeah, we, 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 we have an SUV. But then again, I don't use it to commute to downtown Seattle and back every day. Where do which, you work? I work here out of my home. Okay, so you're doing the telecommute, or exactly. if you will. And, and we have a very, it, with high-speed internet, I have all the computer equipment, things that, you know, 20 years ago, I had, had to have been in a big office yes. downtown. Yes. I did have an office downtown, wised up one day sitting on the freeway. Um, and, <laughs> but, but, yeah, I mean, it, and I'm no smarter in a big building. In fact, in some ways, you can get sucked into groupthink yeah. in, in that yeah. environment if you're not careful. Yeah. But it's just, it's just an added expense, and it's not necessary. So for some people, that's an option. Working exactly. Home. Right. So it, you've got a zero mile commute. Yes. And for, and for the kind of, I guess, what you would call knowledge worker kind of thing, yeah. that's great. But the problem is the reality is for physical workers. People have to go to a plant. Yes. They do construction. They have a, you know, like my brother-in-law that built this fine fireplace. He has to go to the project. Yes. And he has to be there. And there's a vulnerability, again, to, to, to energy and the cost. So if you're, and here what's kind of sad is that some of the people who have the least money to be able to support the high cost, higher cost of fuel, end up living the furthest from the cities because, because that's where the cheap housing is. That's right. And that's because we've subsidized the cheap housing in the suburbs with the cheap fuel. And as the fuel costs begin to rise, they're not going to be, be able to do that anymore, any more than arbitraging cheap labor in China mm. and hauling it over here. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So, but, but on the, I did want to mention, on the, on the investment scenario, is everybody tends to think that you got to put all your money in oil and gas and coal and all these different things. But the irony of it is, no. You can have a much more broadly diversified portfolio of investments. Obviously, invest in yourself first. It's the best money you'll ever send. Okay. Nobody can steal it from you. Nobody can, can lock it down. I mean, it, it's, it's yours. And it may be very, very important if you have to start doing some new tasks. That you didn't so part of the it. investment in yourself could be training yourself in, 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 a, in a skill that everybody right. will need and you don't need to commute for. Or just self for self-preservation, do your own, learn how to do crafts, uh, you know, woodworking and different things. Plus, it's soothing for the soul. But, <laughs> but so you invest in yourself first, both for intellectual tools and physical tools, the skills with your hands, and but most importantly, your brain, because then you can adapt and learn new things. But then you go away, it, down the list, you start getting to say, well, okay, if I own oil and gas and coal companies and all of those different things, but there's a lot of other stuff out there. The railroads are going to take more and more of the business from the truckers mm. because they can mm. move a ton of freight further. Ships haul it even more efficiently. Um, so there's lots of other businesses. What about the infrastructure of the railroads? What about the infrastructure of the shipping industry? You know, um, inland waterways. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. My son at the mm -hmm. ASPO conference put up some, some slides of different things that are outside of the traditional view that everybody has of where you put your money with peak oil. There's a lot more to it. Telecommuting, well, how's that gonna be done? Where's that, who's gonna be doing that? Now the smart grid, this whole idea of a smart grid, right. Mm -hmm. But it may not be what everybody thinks it is. In other words, it may not be the, uh, the battery. I mean, there's lots of battery companies. I can't tell you which battery technology is gonna come out on top. But I do know that if you're gonna plug your car in, the power is gonna more than likely come over a utilities power line. Yes, okay. sure. If we're going to switch to the T. Boone Pickens natural gas, then probably the local utility is going to provide the gas. In fact, that's the way it is. So there are some other ways, more conservative ways, that a person can mm -hmm. pursue. Um, all those wind turbines, they have to get connected some of the, somehow to the grid. Well, I don't have to guess who's going to have the best wind turbine system, but if I know who the infrastructure uh, components are that uh. connect to the power grid, now, there are some choices. But now, having said all of those things, 
in, back in 1999, if I had told you that, that Intel and Microsoft and Cisco and these other high-tech companies were going to double their earnings in the next 10 years, guaranteed, you would have thought, oh, perfect, I'll put my money in. But yet, if you had done that in those three cases, you'd have half your money, even though they did, in fact, more than double their earnings. And why? It's because the market brought down the price of the stock relative to those earnings. Oh. There was a okay, price-earnings ratio. Okay. But the point is, even if you get it right sometimes, you've got to understand the finances of the business, because hmm. it's hmm. a business. You've got to understand the market a little bit, so it's not cut and dried. I mean, everybody knew the Internet was going to be big, but if you put your money in homegrocer.com, it didn't work. You see? Yeah, yeah. And, and the same thing, everybody knew that, I mean, real estate is a good investment, but if you overpaid in 2006 and 5, you, you, you got clocked. Same thing today mm -hmm. on energy mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. alternative energy. Some of those alternative energies can be great. And you don't know which ones yet. So that's know. part of why you're saying yeah. is don't invest in them until it starts to get clearer on I don't need. I don't swing for the fence, at least our perspective is, is to not swing for the fence. Because if you strike out in this game, particularly as you get older, you can't. You don't go back to work. You don't want right. to go back to doing that's it. Right. So, so look for fundamentally sound businesses that meet that peak oil filter, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and go from there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need to find the next Microsoft because with my luck, I might find the next Enron. You know, that's my worry. <laughs> okay. and, and that's where okay. a lot of people slip up. They're trying to make up for adapting their lifestyle, their savings, by trying to find the big gamble, mm -hmm. the big sure. win, the big swing. Um, I keep it simple, keep it boring, and, and you probably can do okay. And, and most people can if they get that peak oil story right. But that's gonna to apply to a lot of other things. I mean, and then there's this whole mm -hmm. issue of you know, population and how that gonna play out, if they're the resource base. I mean, the, the Economist uh, this week said that sometime next year, about mm -hmm. this time, mm -hmm. we're gonna see our seven billionth person on the planet. And you know, it's gonna start getting a little crowded. And, and there's that constrained resource model again. Even if the supply I mean, at which point can the supply keep coming up? And not only of oil, but other resources, oh, every, too. Yeah, everything. You know. And so many of those resources depend on liquid fuels. Diesel fuel. It, 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 the United States, since 2004, has consumed pretty consistently 9 million barrels a day of gasoline. Okay. It, it, we okay. dipped slightly during the recession, but we're pretty much flatlined at 9 million barrels a day. Okay. Diesel fuel, on the other hand, fell dramatically during the recession. In fact, the, everybody talks about how much we cut our oil consumption when we were in a recession. Only 15% of the decline in U.S. oil consumption can be attributed to gasoline. Hmm. 85% hmm. is attributed to industrial and commercial use. Because we were, the, the factories were closed yeah. down and... Our economy and, went on its knees. Yeah. So 85% of the decline okay. in U.S. Okay. oil consumption was a consequence of the recession only 15% related to fuel, or uh, gasoline. Yeah, yeah. Right? So gasoline is still, we're, in fact, this last July, we were consuming right at the all-time high for the month of July mm -hmm. okay, for gasoline. However, diesel fuel, that's the industrial fuel. that drives farms, tractors, trucks, trains. And it's diesel fuel that we pay attention to, far mm -hmm. more than gasoline, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that's going to tell you. And in fact, in, in the Seattle area, Diesel fuel now, for a number of years, has been selling at a premium to gasoline. That's something that you and I never experienced as children. And, and children yeah, meaning diesel, anything prior to age 50. <laughs> <laughs> diesel was always cheaper. Always cheaper. And no longer. Okay. And it's because outside the United States, diesel fuel is the fuel of the uh, uh, even beyond uh, just industrial. I mean, so many more. You know, Europe, over half the cars are diesel. Okay. And so it really is the fuel that, that we pay the most attention mm -hmm. to. Well, mm -hmm. if diesel fuel becomes constrained then all the gasoline won't matter. And in fact, that's what here in the U.S., gasoline consumption is flatlining for, mm -hmm, we've mm -hmm, gone through the recession, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but yet diesel fuel, diesel fuel consumption is starting to come up fairly rapidly though. And, uh, but that's, a, but that's a, a key driver for us to look at. So. And, and certainly, I, you know, the population, the, the demands are gonna continue, 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 continue everywhere. Um, are, some people are starting to say, you know, the U.S. economy we're starting to see come down, and we've only got about three minutes left here. And other economies, China, mm -hmm. Brazil, India, is where they're paying attention to. Do you, do you even look 
and investing abroad? Are you focusing here on the States? We, we do. We, we look abroad. And the first thing we look at is, does this work in a peak oil scenario? OK. And all you got to do is look at India and China with a billion people plus, And you start thinking, OK, if they even rise anything near our consumption levels, what's the likelihood of supply? Now, the, you know, the IEA here just a few weeks ago, when they released their world energy outlook, said that the world will never again meet its 2006 70 million barrel a day crude oil. And crude oil mm. is just crude oil. It's not the unconventional tar sands in it. We'll never see that number again. And that was the International Energy Agency in, in, in their World Energy Outlook 2010. And so if that's true, then how are these over 2 billion people in those two countries alone going to possibly raise their energy consumption, particularly in a liquid fuel environment, mm. to the, anywhere mm. near mm. the standards that are here. We're, we're, we're going to be constrained. The realities of liquid fuel supplies and the timing of their constraints doesn't match well with our solutions. That's the problem. Electrification of the transportation systems here, our cr liquid fuel problem is here, they don't sink. They're too far apart. We get electric cars over here, they're coming, we're going right, to do it. Right. But we've got a liquid fuel crisis coming now. here now. Right. And we need those liquid fuels to help the build out of the rest of the electricals. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. so we have this gap. So you have to do this bridge. We've got this gap. Between, uh -huh. And that's the part that scares me the most, mm. is that we don't have a bridge for that. We can't get across that gap efficiently. So I think we're going to see economic constraints and a lot of the things that everybody's assumed for the last 100 years doesn't necessarily play out. Does it mean the end of the world? No. Okay. We will accommodate to this. It won't be the end of the world. Some people will give up fossil fuels because they can't afford them. Certain uses will not be made anywhere because there'll be no value added to them to make them worthwhile. Mm -hmm. We will waste less. We won't fly or quick overnighters to Las Vegas anymore. They'll go away. Well, that means that jet fuel will be available for other uses. Mm -hmm. We will accommodate. Now, how fast we have to accommodate is the part that's the unknown, that's the risk, and, and that I can't really speak to, because it's the unknown. But. Thank you for actually the perspective that you have. It's OK. You don't have to be the prophet. We're not going to lay you <laughs> on the line to say it's what year it's going to happen. But thank you for sort of adding some of your peak oil filter and advice for this. Cool. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching Peak Moment. I'm with Jim Hansen, who puts all of the investments of his life energy, actually, money and his life, through a filter of peak oil, which is on its way. Join us next time. <laughs>